me. Father in heaven, I thank you for this day. I thank you uh, for the beautiful sunshine, Lord, for uh, even the frigid temperatures this morning, Lord. May it be an end to uh, mosquitoes and wasps and all those things that have been continuing to be there, Lord. And we just give you great glory and honor for who you are. We give this time to you, and I ask that your Holy Spirit would come upon me, anoint my mouth to preach your word, anoint our ears to hear it. In Christ's name, amen. I uh, appreciate your continued prayers for me this morning. I am cold. I don't know what happened. Uh, someone turned off my endless summer that I've been enjoying here. And uh, whew, walked across the street this morning. And, and my office is actually controlled by a thermostat that's in the uh, common classroom here. And I walked in there knowing that it would still be set to air conditioning and a temperature read 55. I said, well, it's going to be an interesting uh, morning in the office. And so I managed to get rather frigid and was very welcoming of my uh, vestments this morning for the 745 service, I can assure you. Uh, So your continual prayers will be very welcome. So, you know, last week, what we really saw were those initial first fruits of Adam and Eve's sin really come to rest in the world. We saw that with the murder of Abel by his brother Cain. And we see more in this story than just the first murder. We actually see in Cain the presentation of the way you and I now so often respond to sin itself. You see, Cain had every opportunity to respond correctly, to repent and to break his heart and to come humbly before his God. But that's not what we see at all. What we see is Cain's face downtrodden and his countenance marred. But he's not mad at his sin. He's not even really mad at being caught. What he's mad about is his rejection of himself that's seen in the rejection of his offering. And of course, this feeling just continues to lay there and stir up and stir up until finally Cain rises up and kills Abel because he thinks to himself, I must be great. I have to be important. I'm the firstborn. I'm following in my father's footsteps. I'm a farmer like Adam is a farmer. My mother said over me, with the help of God, I've brought forth a man. I'm going to be the one to break the curse that this serpent has placed us under. But instead of breaking the curse, if Cain did anything, he intensified it. Ian did a great job in showing us that what was going on when that sin was that it was personal, it was internal, and it was cosmic. But that's not all we're going to see there. As Cain's actions in that whole scenario revealed to us that his yielding to the power of sin and his murder of Abel was actually the second step in at least a two-step process. And the first step in that was Cain actually giving way to idolatry. You see, Cain started loving something more than he loved God. In this case, he actually loved his own acceptance, his own standing before God more than he loved God himself. And because of that, idolatry, he decided to kill his brother who he saw as a rival, an impediment to his standing before God. You see, the fall, friends, had severed every relationship. We already knew that it had severed a relationship between humanity and God. We see that in Adam and Eve. We see in Cain that our relationship with ourselves are severed. You see, Cain had the wrong view of himself, had the wrong relationship with himself. As my wife is so prone to say, Cain loved himself way too much. And we also see that relationships with God are completely severed. So idolatry was in the garden, no doubt. Adam and Eve loved themselves more than they should. Idolatry was at work there in that field when Cain rose up to kill Abel. And idolatry remains there, ever-present in the darkness, waiting to seize upon you and I, whenever given the opportunity. You see, idolatry, friends, after all, is really the root of all human sin. Yes, I know St. Augustine calls it pride, but what is pride other than the placing of oneself in the very place of God? The sin of idolatry is always there, and at the core of idolatry is infidelity. 
And I think this is why when in English we were creating the words adultery and idolatry to translate these Hebrew terms, I think there was some purpose in making them sound the same. Because at the core, both of them are unfaithfulness, infidelity. In adultery, there is unfaithfulness to one's spouse. In idolatry, there is unfaithfulness to one's God. But in both cases, it is an instance of loving oneself more than we should. And it's the genesis then of other sins, the tender itself that raises the fire of sin. Sure, there are age-old staples that exist across the ages that are always temptations to pull men into forms of idolatry. Sex, money, power. But today I want us to focus on something that's revealed in Cain's reaction to God's punishment over him. And friends, that's the idol of greatness. That's what's at work in the heart of Cain. He wanted to be important. He wanted to be Great. And so in his punishment, God sentences Cain to be a wanderer on the earth, a person with no place of his own, which if you're a a farmer, to lose your sense of place, your sense of connectivity to the ground, is is a strong judgment. And what's telling for us is that Cain will have no acceptance of that judgment, no acceptance of that punishment to the point that he actually takes up the task of building a city. Now, if God has sentenced you to be a wanderer, a nomad, what is the exact opposite of that? To build a city. So that is what Cain he goes in the exact opposite direction that God has actually sentenced him to do that because he is still in the pursuit of his own personal greatness. Now, friends, greatness for you and I today is held out as such a virtue It's going to be so hard for us this morning to see that as part and parcel of the sin of idolatry, but we're going to try to see that this morning. And I want you to think through this with me for a few moments. One of the best-selling books on leadership in the last 25 years, perhaps a minor classic at this point, is a book uh, by Collins entitled From Good to Great. It's, and it's a fantastic little book. It's something that I've read and reread a number of times. I use its leadership principles in my own life. Uh, one of its key teachings there is get the right people on the right seat, on the right bus, and then your organization will run much more smoothly. And it's, it's absolutely true. There's a lot of good things to be gained from Collins's good to great. But it reveals something about our nature, our time. Something as old as Cain himself and his city-building project, a desire to be great. Just think about the title of the book, From Good to Great. And that's just one leadership book. Friends, I mean, it, the entire genre, and, and I do enjoy it. It's probably the second largest number of books that I have in my collection are, are leadership books. Um, they all kind of exist to do one thing, to celebrate the success stories of prominent leaders who, for the most part, they all share this one thing in common. They've gone from multimillionaires to billionaires. That's their kind of uniting trait. So we'll just step back, let that set in for a moment. And, and in that case, um, the leadership of most of these people are CEOs. And their, their leadership styles are celebrated as something that if we would just mimic and implement in our lives, then we would follow in their footsteps of greatness. And we would finally ourselves move from you know, just being a, a million, multimillionaire to be, being a billionaire. We, could, we can just do that if we would just follow these principles. So hear me well this morning. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with working hard and utilizing leadership resources. I mean, I love to work hard. If any of you know me, you know that I get my day started at 4.30 or 5.30 most mornings so that I can get to the office around 7.30 or 8 o'clock so I have an hour to an hour and a half to where nobody else is here. It's just me in my office. And if I can do that, if I get there at 7.30 and I have till 9 o'clock, I may actually get 60% of what I need done for the day because nobody's going to knock on my door. Nobody's going to interrupt. There's not going to be an emergency for the most part that early in the morning. I can do that. I, I like that. I love to, to, to work hard. So I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but our society is obsessed with greatness to the point that you can have a book with a title, From Good to Great, 
which indicates that now good has become the enemy of great. It's no longer just good enough. It's the enemy of greatness. And you see that is going on in the heart of Cain as well. So let's, let's take a look at the text, see if we can get some more clarity as we look at the danger of greatness. The story presented in the text this morning is actually rather striking. We, we, we open kind of in the middle of the story. You know, the, the murder has already taken place. All this has happened. And now we get to the moment to where judgment has been pronounced. And we open up actually, <clears throat> pardon me, with Cain complaining to God about the judgment, about the punishment. He says, it's more than I can take. You see, he's been a farmer. Now he's cut off from the land. He's cut off from what has been his vocation. He knows he's being cut off from God's face, so to speak. He's being expelled. And the same word that's being used here is the exact same word that was used of Adam and Eve when they were pushed out of the garden. And this indicates that Cain is actually being placed further outside of relationship with God. He's one step further removed at this point than even Adam and Eve are. He knows this is happening. But, but what is amazing is that even in this moment of judgment, God actually places a sign of protection over Cain. It says, hey, look, no one's going to get you back. There's going to be no avenger of blood for what you have done. If they do, they will answer to me. But you know what? Cain is unable to see that. All that Cain can see is that he has been cast off from the land that he loves, forced into a lifetime of wandering in the land of Nod, in the east of Eden. And what's kind of funny here is the word for wander and the word for this area that he moves to, Nod, they sound extremely similar in Hebrew. It would be a, a rhyme, so to speak. And so to say this is a wandering person living in the land of wanderers. That's what he's being sentenced to. But you know what, friends? It's that part of the sentence he finds impossible to bear. It's that part. It's not the being cut off from God. It's not the being cut off from the ground. It's being, it's being sentenced to being nothing. Sentenced to unimportance. Because as a farmer, his entire identity would have been tied to belonging to a place, belonging to a piece of land that he knew intimately and knew well, knew just how to plow to get the most yield. That would have been his identity. That would have been what was going on in his mind. <clears throat> and now sent to desert wastelands that will yield him no fruit, yield him no, pro no produce, and we noted earlier that the root of Cain's sin is that he was his own object of worship. He loved himself more than he loved God. So when he finds himself outside of God's graces, rather than looking inwardly for the root of his rejection and seeking repentance, all he can see is Abel's acceptance before God. And so he rises up and he, and he, he killed him. And then when God sentences him to this life of unimportance, he can't stand it. But that seed of rebellion is already at work in his heart. And he devises a way to make a name for himself by building a city. Something that we'll see pop up again in a few chapters down the road in Genesis. He says to himself, God may have sentenced me to the life of a nomad, but I will build my own city. And it is here that we see the story take this completely strange twist because... In the midst of even this rebellion, you see God at work being faithful to the promises He's made over Adam and Eve all the way back that we covered weeks ago. You know, we talked about it in Genesis 1 and 2. We laid out the, the kind of cultural mandate and then kind of a priestly mandate where humanity is called to both rule and have dominion and to bear the image and to follow God's creative acts by building something out of nothing and to then protect those things and to make that part of his priestly service before God to actually live out his vocation before him. We saw that in Genesis 1 and 2. And we see that even in Cain's rebellious activity, God's promise over humanity at that point is not completely done away with. Cain is still doing image-bearing activity. His city is left nondescript. We're not told that it was a success. We're not told that it was a failure. It's just kind of presented like his family as a mixed bag. We're 
cultural expansion continues, but it's tainted with human sin. And you see this play out in his genealogy, so to speak. And by the way, excellent job with the names. Very hard passage. Good job. Good job. Little is said about most of Cain's descendants. For the most part, they just passed over. And then you get to Lamech, who in every way seems to be a chip off the old block for Cain. We have with him the beginning of polygamy. And and the way the story is presented, you have these two names, Adah and Zillah, and, and these names are very poetic in Hebrew, and they're indicative of two minstrels, women who would stand before someone and constantly sing, and even their names are, are reminiscent in Hebrew of, of beauty. And so Lamech has, you know, got two beautiful women that stand before him and sing his praises all the time. So this is, this is what he likes and what he loves and what he's telling them to do. So he tells them this poem about his great activities and wants them to sing about it and to make his name known. Here he is. He wants to have a great name as well. He follows Cain's footsteps as a murderer. And like Cain's murder of Abel, you know what? It's over a minor thing. The, the way the story is presented is you have Lamech, who should know better, somehow is injured by a minor, a young person is the way this is described. And it could be a young lad of even 25 or 30 years, but still, relatively speaking, a young man in the culture of the early ancient Near East, a young man, someone that should be given the benefit of the doubt for making a foolish mistake. But Lamech, in anger at being somewhat injured, strikes him down and kills him in cold-blooded murder. He's the one that bears the responsibility. But you know what? He has no remorse. And what's actually going on here when he says, if Cain was going to be avenged sevenfold, let me be avenged seventy-sevenfold, he's actually not asking for that. He's mocking God. He's saying to his two beautiful minstrels, he's saying, y'all tell this whole world about how bad I am. Because if anybody comes after me, I'll kill them. And I just showed you that by killing this young man. If anybody crosses my path, I'll kill them. So he's wanting them to sing of his praise, to sing of his his mighty deeds, so to speak. You know, and then we get this pause and you wonder, why is it here that Lamech, who is clearly carrying on the line of Cain, why do we get this break in the story? Why do we get this presentation of his three children? Because I think the point being that even in the midst of human idolatry, God's faithfulness goes on. Let me show you exactly how that works. You have three people mentioned here. You have Jabal, Jubal, and Tubal Cain. And of course, you hear, even in your own ears, in English, you hear the way those kind of sound together. Uh, and uh, if you read Hebrew, it's even closer. And then the verbs used to describe what they do all have a very unique Q sound in them as well. So it's a very poetic section of Scripture. And so you have Jabal, uh, excuse me, Jabal, and um, he, Jabal, is um, described as someone who lives in tents and expands animal husbandry. So he's, you know, uh, someone in livestock. But if you're paying attention closely to the story, what you see in, in, in Jabal Is someone actually willing to live under the pronounced judgment that God has made on Cain? He's willing to live within the parameters that God has set. He's like, I am a wanderer. And you know what? I have to raise livestock because the land doesn't produce for me the food that it should to keep me alive. He's willing to step back into the judgment that God has pronounced on that family and to live it out. And with that, you see a minor blessing because, friends, what was Abel? Cain was the farmer. Abel was in livestock. So you see here this turn, even in Cain's descendants, Lamech's son, this turn back, a minor acceptance back before God, where he's God's faithfulness to who and what he is is even shown in this genealogy. And the same thing can be said for his brother Jabal. Jabal is another unlikely party in a story. He is described as the father of musical instruments. And what we see here is another expansion of culture we didn't and shouldn't expect. God's call to humanity survives unfettered even by the sin of Cain. 
Here is his descendant responsible for creating the instruments and abilities that will somebody someday be used by God's priests and people to praise him in the tabernacle and the temple. This is the continual march of culture. The taking of nature's raw materials and creating something from them. This is bearing the image of God. Something not lost in the fall, even on Cain's family. But while the good of the image bearing marches on in Cain's family, so does the evil that is now common to mankind. The third male child of Lamech bears the name of Cain forward. He is called Tubal Cain and described as the fashioner of all things iron and bronze. And inferred there is, is, is any tool that can be made from those metals, but what's implied is weapons. And Tubal Cain is presented as the one that makes it possible for the murderous rage of Cain and Lamech to be so easily executed on a whole different level. And so, yes, the same good that comes from making the tool to make the stronger plow goes into the stronger weapon, the sharper sword. And so you see these contributions to culture that are twisted. You, you have destructive forces like polygamy and weapons manufacturing delivered in the family of Cain, but you also have music and you also have the expansion of livestock, things that are very good. What you see is that our culture-making activities are a mixed bag. And friends, this is why greatness is such a danger for you and I. Because in our yearning and desire for greatness, there's probably good things and there's probably bad things. It's a mixed bag. There is sin and there is blessing there. Think about this with me. German scientist that invented the V2 rocket, what did he dream about? Going to space. Expanding the frontiers of human knowledge. But you know what he got to watch? His rockets do a masterful job of delivering a deadly payload to the people of Great Britain in World War II. That's what he got to watch his rockets do. Not expand the frontiers of human knowledge, but to expand the frontiers of human suffering. The men who helped harness the power of the atom for us dreamed of providing energy in a world of scarcity. But before they could live to see the dream of the first nuclear power plant delivering power to millions of homes, they had to deliver into the hands of humanity the very means by which we could destroy the entire world. Leaving one of them to famously say in reflection that he had become death and the destroyer of worlds. All these men, beautiful minds, great minds, some of the greatest of our century. They pursued great work Work that has been immensely beneficial for mankind. But work that was also used for deadly purposes as well. This is always part of the inherent search for greatness that we all long for as humans. You know, and it's not just secular people that deal with this. I mean, Ian and I deal with this. I mean, I'll pick on Ian for a minute. I know that he would, he would love to be Tim Keller. Not necessarily to be Tim Keller, but he would love to be, you know, influential, that pastor that other people read, and to have that influence, and to have that cultural input, and to, and to be that, and, and to have that kind of impact, that, that kind of greatness. We, 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 we'd be foolish not to want that. But at the same time, there's notoriety, and there's all kind of things that come along with that, and I struggle with that too, you know, we... You know, I, I went to school and pursued a PhD with all of my heart and with all of my might because in so many ways, in the dark parts of my heart, by God, I wanted to be right when I argued with somebody. <laughs> and so for me, that the temptation is, is, is to be that great scholar, to be that one that everybody talks to, to be the one that gets invitations to speak at mere Anglicanism, to, to be that person, to be Tom Wright, to be... D.A. Carson, I want people to be sitting at my in their house watching me on video, Danny. Uh, you know, and it, that's what, <laughs> that's kind of what I want. And so the danger for greatness, that, that pursuit of greatness, for, for what reason? 
for, for my own sense of self. I mean, it's there even in, in, in my heart. It's there in Ian's heart. It's not just in the, in the heart of the person that wants to go from being a multimillionaire to a billionaire. It's not just there. It's even in, in, the, in our hearts that we, that we have to deal with that. And we, we have to ask ourselves the question all the time, what is greatness? And why do we define greatness so often monetarily? Why do we define it that way? Do we really want the lives of billionaires that we, that we idealize? I mean, you know, there's this guy, and I can't think of his last name. I know his first name's Dan. He's this big bearded guy, and he inherited all of his money, and he's like the king of Instagram. And if you, like, follow him on Instagram, his life is like, if you can imagine a frat boy with the world's biggest trust fund doing anything that a frat boy can imagine, that's pretty much the life this guy lives. I mean, he just, like, drives tanks over Hummers and just, just because he's just got enough money to do this and he just doesn't have any sense. I mean, is that really the kind of life that we would want? I mean, is that really what we want? I mean, he's the kind of person that would more than likely turn up dead of some kind of overdose in the future. I mean, that's really what usually happens in that kind of situation. That's not what we want. And, and most of these other guys, they live really boring lives. Warren Buffett is rich because he's boring. I mean, he really is. I mean, he still drives the same car he had in the 50s, lives in the same house. I mean, he's frugal beyond compare. I mean, he's probably like Clark Howard. He probably takes a razor and blows it dry so it lasts forever.